Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's Coffee Chat. My name is Daniel Truckenbro, and I'm an Associate Marketing Manager for Early Childhood Products at Brooks Publishing. And I'm very happy to have Alana Griffin-Schnitz, Jackie Joseph, and Megan Vonder Ems with us to talk about promoting positive family partnerships within the pyramid model. Uh, so before we begin, I just have a few things to go over. Alana, if you could go to the yeah. next slide. Thanks. Nope. Okay, there you go. Sorry. There we go. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, just a few tips for the webinar. Um, so if you have any other applications open, such as other internet browsers or your email, uh, if you close that, that can increase bandwidth uh, for your viewing experience today. And if you have any questions during the webinar, there is a questions tab in the webinar panel, and you can enter your questions there. And then we'll be doing a Q&A session towards the end of the webinar. And if you'd like to minimize the webinar panel, there's a little orange arrow and that can shrink the panel. And then if you want to expand the panel, you can click that orange arrow to expand it. And uh, lastly, if you have any audio issues during the webinar today, uh, first check your audio tab in the webinar panel to make sure that you have the correct speakers open or correct speakers selected. Uh, make sure that your speakers are turned up. And if that's not working, uh, I would recommend reconnecting to the webinar. So just exit out and join back in and that'll usually alleviate any audio issues that you may be having. Uh, so Alana, Megan, and Jackie are chapter authors of Unpacking the Pyramid Model, a practical guide for preschool teachers. So Unpacking the Pyramid Model was created by pyramid model developers and experts, and it's the first book to provide a comprehensive step-by-step -step overview of the pyramid model for children ages two to five. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about Unpacking the Pyramid Model, you can go to bpub.fyi forward slash unpacking dash pm. And you'll also be receiving a link to the book in your follow-up email tomorrow. Uh, we're also doing a book giveaway, and we're giving away one free copy of Unpacking the Pyramid Model. So one attendee will be selected at random and emailed after the webinar. So if you submit your questions during the webinar, that can increase your chances of winning. And last but not least, uh, certificates of attendance are available for all webinar viewers and recording viewers. Uh, and I'll provide a little bit more information about certificates towards the end of the webinar. Uh, so without further delay, I'd like to introduce your presenters today. Uh, Jackie Joseph is the Executive Director at the RISE School of Denver, Colorado, and has been involved in research and technical assistance for the LEAP model, the Pyramid model, Prevent, Teach, Reinforce for Young Children, and Prevent, Teach, Reinforce for Families. Dr. Joseph's professional and research in interests include young children with this challenging behavior and interventions for improving their social emotional competence. Uh, Megan Vonder Ems is the Human Services Practitioner with the Florida Center for Inclusive Communities at the University of South Florida and a staff member at the National Center for Pyramid Model Innovations. Megan provides training, technical assistance, and ongoing coaching support for early childhood programs implementing pyramid model supports. And Alana Griffin-Schnitz is an Assistant Research Professor at Juniper Gardens Children's Project where she focuses on supporting pre- and in-service teachers to implement evidence-based practices and on families to promote social emotional competence and to address challenging behaviors in young children. Dr. Schnitz has been working on projects related to the pyramid model for over 10 years. Uh, so Jackie, Megan, and Alana, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that was a great introduction, Danielle, so we appreciate it. Um, so we're really excited um, to talk to you today about family partnerships within the pyramid model. Um, Alana, Jackie, and myself, um, this topic comes easy to us. We're all um, family members of very young children and get really excited about talking to people about ways to strengthen and involve um, family partnerships within the pyramid model. So that's gonna be our major focus today. We're gonna um, discuss ideas and ways to um, really encourage our relationships with families, ways to build those relationships and really embed that within the pyramid model. We'll spend some time um, talking about how to have meaningful conversations and improve our connections with families. And we're hoping you leave today with some ideas um, and some resources for how we can um, help family members um, implement those social emotional strategies that are so um, integral to the pyramid model. So the conversation today really is focused on the pyramid model. And for those, there might be um, many of you or some of you on the webinar today who may not have heard of the pyramid model and some of you who um, get really excited and are enthusiastic about pyramid model implementation. So we're gonna give a little brief overview of the pyramid model 
um, in hopes that you'll get the message that the family partnerships really are at the heart of the pyramid model. So the pyramid model for promoting social emotional competence in infants and young children is a framework of evidence-based practices for promoting young children's healthy social and emotional development. So if you look at the pyramid, um, it is a multi-tiered system of support. It's based on universal promotion for all children, and that includes practices that focus on um, those nurturing and responsive relationships, so creating those caring connections for children so that they can learn and develop those important social emotional skills. Um, and that includes relationships with family. So it really is at the foundation of the pyramid model. But as we go up and we look at additional universal supports for all children, we're going to be talking about ways in which we can include families in our high quality supportive environments in our classrooms and our early childhood programs. Um, and then this multi-tiered system of support focuses on prevention. So we know that some children will need access to additional um, supports and services to be able to learn those social emotional skills. And we want to help families and partner with families on how we can um, implement some of those key social emotional skills at home and in the community. And then we um, know that there are um, students and young children that need intensive intervention. So um, the pyramid model um, partners with families and engages families in providing um, intensive supports for children who might have ongoing persistent challenging behavior. But at each tier of the pyramid model, we're really um, considering and thinking about ways in which we can engage families um, and really promote that family partnership. So we're going to um, first look at how um, we think about when we think about family partnership, what are those practices? So this is a checklist that is included in the book chapter. It's also available for download. I'm looking at it on my, um, the, I don't know what to call that, our little um, go-to webinar. You can download it as a PDF. This checklist covers some of those critical practices that um, are really helpful for building those family partnerships. This is a resource you can use. You can look at it today and see that we are going to cover some of the topics and the practices on here. We're not going to get to every single one. Um, for that, you're going to have to read the book chapter to find out all, all of those strategies. Um, but this is a great resource to serve as a self-assessment so you can see how am I building my relationships with families and what can we do to strengthen those relationships in the future. And we start the conversation on family partnerships um, because we think that those family partnerships, um, that's what starts from the beginning, um, strong pyramid model implementation. When we think about um, family partnership, we really want to focus on um, gaining family input so that we're involving families from the beginning of pyramid model implementation. So if we're focusing on social emotional development, that we give families the opportunity to provide input and to gain knowledge about family values. So that's gonna come up on today's webinar. We're gonna talk about different ways that we can um, understand the values of families and get to know um, their experiences and their culture so that we can identify any potential cultural mismatch. And if we're thinking about young children and we're thinking about early childhood classrooms and families, um, it's really important to consider all of the development that's happening at that young age and how important it is to think about what do families need, what do families value, um, and how we can support that in the classrooms and the settings that young children are in. Um, and this helps us address the needs, the cultural norms, and we think about the values of the program and the community, and those families are part of that community. Um, we want to um, make sure that we're being culturally responsive to the families we serve, and getting input is just one way in which we can help um, be responsive. So the idea of family input, there are so many things we can do to gauge input from families, but we want to share two kind of concrete examples. When we say, what do we mean 
when we say partnering, especially around social emotional development, we want to share two really um, great resources that you can use to really get information from families so we can understand more about what the family's values and what the family may need. So this is one resource that we find really helpful. It's called um, My Teacher Wants to Know. It is available and we'll share on the website where many of these resources can be found. But this is a resource that asks families um, very specific questions about social emotional development of their young child. So by asking families how we want to effectively support your child, what strategies work best for you? What else do you need from us to support your child? Getting that family's input um, is really a way to understand the needs and be able to support the family when we're talking about pyramid model. So this is a great resource. Another way to partner with families is to think beyond sharing. And so when we think of family engagement, we often think of, oh, I share with my, I talk with my family so frequently, I share, I'm sharing information with them. We're talking about how the child is doing in my classroom. But and within the pyramid model, one way we can um, get families input is from the beginning. Um, so this um, example, is a little survey that asks families if we're gonna teach, we're gonna be teaching rules and expectation in our program, which is a key practice in pyramid model implementation, helping children learn the expectations and the rules within um, their um, early childhood settings. So we can ask families, what's important to you? What do you think would be helpful for your child to learn? So instead of sharing at our program, we're going to be safe and we're going to be kind, which are great expectations um, for teaching young children. We can ask and seek families input. It's just one way where we can get to know what values do families have and we can really focus on getting that input from each and every family um, when we're trying to support um, and build those relationships. So this idea of partnering with families and getting their input um, really helps build kind of that ongoing engagement with the pyramid model. But what we know about relationships and all relationships, it takes work. That's something when Jackie and Alana and I were talking about um, brainstorming the idea about relationships with families is that it's just like any other relationship we have with our partner, with our own children, with our colleagues that we have to put in lots of connections and lots of opportunities to make those positive interactions. So we can think about the way we support families like a piggy bank. So if you can imagine that each family has a piggy bank, and this is a metaphor we use quite frequently when we're doing pyramid model trainings. Um, if we think about, we have a piggy bank and it's in our, our emotional piggy bank. And each time we get a deposit in that piggy bank, it fills us up. It helps us feel good. Um, it builds our self-esteem, our ability to connect with others. Um, we don't want an empty piggy bank. An empty piggy bank is not useful for anyone. No one wants an empty piggy bank. What we want to do is make those frequent, ongoing connections with family. So we're going to share some of those ways. And Jackie has some really great illustrations from the program that she's a director of about how we can have these deposits. Um, and when thinking about these these frequent connections with families, we want to make sure that we can answer the these type of questions. So do you have a comfortable relationship with each family? Do they know when they can come talk to you? Do they feel comfortable, you know, talking to um, the people who are caring for their young child? Um, how do families know what is happening in the classroom each day? So are we communicating daily classroom happenings and does, do families know what's happening about their specific child? So I know what's going on in the entire classroom, but do I know what my young child is doing? And then we wanna go beyond just sharing. And so that's something I think early childhood educators are great at doing, sharing what's happening at school, sending home the fun, messy art projects that young children do, sending home stories that they've read. But we wanna make sure that we're allowing families the opportunity to share what's happening at home, and how that might impact um, the child at school. 
Um, and then the last thing we're going to talk about it a little bit more um, is we want to make sure that families see themselves in their classroom, which we know right now we're going to talk about all of this, knowing that we're in the middle of a pandemic and that's very different right now. But this notion that children, young children should see themselves in their classroom, they should see their community and their families reflected um, in the classroom environment. That's one way we can make those deposits and build those relationships up with families. I mean, then it's really not about all families. It's not about making deposits for all the families who are so easy to reach, for all the families who might be the first to do, I think of my young daughter and they'd always use the sign up genius. So who's the first you know, family to sign up for strawberries for on Valentine's Day? We're talking about making connections for each and every family. Um, and so we want to be able, um, and these are ideas that we shared um, in the book chapter, um, how we can make connections around the pyramid model with families. And one is we can ask family members how they want to be a part of the classroom, consider family membership and how the culture and experiences might have shaped the way the family wants to engage in the classroom. And we wanna extend ideas to families of how they can become involved. So if we have, um, you know, you have a young child and they're part of a multi-generational family and um, how can grandfather become involved if grandfather is part of that um, ongoing, you know, the ongoing relationship with that family. Think outside kind of that nuclear family so that we can have different ways for different family members to be part of and engaged in the classroom. Um, and we want to get to know families so that family has, that each family has an opportunity to share their goals not only their short term, like what just what do you want your child to do in my three year old preschool classroom, but what is your vision for your child long term? What are your hopes? Um, it's a great way to make deposits with family. Um, and we want to make sure um, I said it before and you'll probably hear us say it again that families should. Sure. Sorry, doesn't understand that. Um, we want to make sure that families see themselves represented in the classroom environment that we're giving families various ways to share that valuable information about their culture. Um, that's what helps affirm culture and identity, that when we understand the family and we take the time to get to know the family and what they value and what they hope and what's their goals for their children. And um, then last, one way we talk about, and Jackie's gonna expand upon this, is um, bi-directional communication is how is one way we can also build those deposits for each family. Um, we want to determine how each family wants to receive and provide information um, so that we can get that two-way kind of open communication with families and that it we need that kind of those we talk about the frequency of connections. That the more connections we have with families, um, the stronger relationship can be built. So Jackie's going to share a little bit about how we can really work on different ways to connect and communicate with families. Yeah, so I'll be talking about communicating with families um, for a bit through some examples today, because like Megan was saying, we know that that regular, open, bi-directional communication is the foundation for positive relationships, which is the foundation for just true, authentic partnerships with families. We were really intentional when we were talking about and writing this chapter that we want to take that concept of family engagement to the next level. We're not just trying to check in and share and engage families. We want to provide opportunities for them to openly check in and share information with us. Um, as well, right? We want to, like Megan was saying, we want to make sure that that's bi-directional. So we, I love how she also said that these relationships with families are work. And so we want to put some effort into ensuring that all families have um, bi-directional communication from everybody. I'll say center just because that's my frame of mind right now, but know that that extends to wherever we're supporting and caring for or educating young children, right? So that they get and they, they check in and share with their classroom team, with the director from one another. For us, we're an inclusive nonprofit therapeutic child care center. Like that's a, a big mouthful. Uh, so all of our children, whether they have a disability, 
or, or delay or not, have a team of therapists who support them as well. So we want to make sure that families know all of these people are wrap rounding, uh, wrapping around and supporting your, your child. And we all want to partner with you to do that, right? Um, we want to check in and share in a variety of ways. Some of the most common ways are through an app or texting or emailing or calling. Other things that we talk about um, like private Facebook groups, although I was just reading an article that says those might not be cool anymore. So whatever the new cool way to have private groups are, I don't know. Um, family bulletin boards. I know there are even virtual ways to provide that information now. People are getting creative with, you know, Google Drive folders and things like that. Print materials and links. I love that we have such great relationships with our families that families are always sending me links and materials as well, just as we're sending them and sharing uh, meetings and conferences, home visits, volunteering, observations, all of those, all of those things are just the multiple and varied ways that we can check in and share with families. We want to do like Megan was saying, um, in the LEAP preschool model, model, we call them, you know, regular social hits. And that's how I oftentimes think of building our authentic relationships and communicating with families as well. We want to do them quite frequently in maybe faster or quicker, more efficient ways, and then um, very regularly every day. And then we want to provide opportunities to get more in-depth and have more meaningful conversations with them regularly throughout the year and then as other things come up that we think we we want to partner with them more on or that they want to partner with us more on right and so we also want to consider how families want to receive and share information so we decided at our program that on our communication app we only share positive information that's going to provide deposits for families piggy banks so we don't ever bring up any topics of concern or things that we want to have a more serious conversation about on the app we're using that as just our way to provide very nice quick positive interactions and communication with families and then anything more serious we might need as a team or we might discuss um, what do we think the best way to start the conversation with a family about this is? Like, do we want to schedule a phone call? Do we want to start talking to them about this at drop off or pick up? Do we want to send it in an email, but might they miss it or might they take the tone of something differently? So those are just kind of all of those nuanced now that we even with COVID live in this more technological world um, considerations that we really want to think about as we're communicating with families and these preferences for communication change from family to family. And while it is maybe some extra effort on us to share information in with text with some families and email with some families and maybe in an app with other families, I think it's worth the effort to ensure that we are communicating um, and that families are able to respond and communicate back with us in their most efficient, effective, or preferred method of communication as well, right? Because it's bi-directional and we don't want it to just be one directional, so we're just sharing it, but we want to engage with them on whatever platform that they can most easily share and respond back to us with as well. And um, on the, uh, we also want to remember to ask families you know, how they're doing, what they need, ideas that they might have for meaningful ways to be involved in the program um, as well, like partnership happens in, in all of those ways. Um, and they have some great ideas for what's meaningful for them. I'm always surprised when I hear about like what would fill a family's bucket <laughs> um, to be to like I had a call yesterday where somebody said they wanted to come plant a garden for us and be our gardener and I was like that's so wonderful and I wouldn't have ever thought of that if we weren't talking about this um I put this little picture here it's an example of just one of those quick social hits with families the quick deposit the family checked in their son and said Batman is here and the teacher responded by saying, he took off his sweater and says now he's Spider-Man. And that seems silly, but when I saw this, I thought about um, John Gottman calls 
he, he does a lot of marriage therapy research and he calls bids for attention or bids for communication, um, even though like it's required that this that families tell us that they're there so we can go meet them at their car. But you could look at Batman is here instead of saying just my child is here as a bid for a communication. And the teacher could have said coming or she could have said or she could have ignored it and just showed up. But she took that opportunity. She took that sliding lap, that um, sliding door moment to open the door and respond to that family's bid for attention and connect with them in this silly, playful way. And, and those types of interactions, they go they go pretty far with families, especially when life can feel quite heavy um, many days right now. Um, this next slide is not from our program. It's from maybe, yeah, no, it's from another program. Um, but I think that during COVID, one of the values of our field that has been impacted the most is family partnerships. And I'm sharing some examples here of how after this one how we're doing it at, at our program but i'll be completely transparent that we're continuing and constantly evolving in how to really make family partnerships work right now and um we we also we feel like we're not doing it um to the level that we were able to do it when um like in colorado families um are not entering our building still right now and so um it just it creates a different feeling for all of this and i really want to acknowledge that as well um but here's an example of what i'm calling like a communication station so a lot of programs have set up um hand washing stations outside so the family can come up and they can support their child to wash their hands before they enter um the school but then there's also you know information on clipboards that families can reference and ask more about um, as they're there it's another check-in point for families to share or for the school to communicate and families to communicate and then you'll see that rules and expectations at eye level and the entryway just some some ideas that if families aren't seeing as much of those pyramid model practices as they used to because they're not coming into the classroom to let them know you know to just kind of encourage at every level or every touch point that they have with the program right now that we are still using the pyramid model and prioritizing that um we do curbside drop off but we made the decision to individually go to each family's car so i'm not there yet sorry Alan, but that's okay you can totally look at this um we do curbside drop off um and so we go to each car to make sure we have an individual interaction with the family um, at the beginning and end of the day still which has been really meaningful for us um and we meet with our parent action committee every Friday. They give us a pulse of what families are saying um, to one another and they're letting us know, hey, we're zoomed out. We don't wanna be zooming anymore. We wanna find other creative ways to, to you know, communicate and interact with y'all, but also with one another um, because it's another important thing that we wanna support is families having the opportunity to communicate with one another. Um, but as a director, I really want to, just emphasize that if we, we we need to encourage our teams to make family partnerships a priority, which means that as much as we can and as much as we can keep it at the forefront of our minds, that means that um, giving teachers and teaching teams and therapists and specialists and everybody and families time to communicate with one another and paying for that communication because we value it is is really really important so i just wanted to to emphasize that you know if if we value it and if we can in any way demonstrate that um that it's a priority i think those are two ways time and just compensation that we can do that i'm ready for the next one yeah. <laughs> so um these are from the communication app that we use i think that most programs have these now we didn't until this year we were actually able to get it funded through a grant so if you're at somewhere that doesn't have it funders are supporting these types of efforts knowing that it's important to have bidirectional communication during COVID times especially as families aren't coming into the program um but when we got our app we sat down and we decided what types of information do we want to share with um, and across families and we decided that we would 
share therapy notes and we would do that quick communication to let families know what their children are doing individually and with their friends throughout the day and that we would focus on the pyramid model and social examples to really um, demonstrate how their children are all included um, throughout the day. So in these two examples, um, you'll see that. So on the left, we're emphasizing that importance of routines and it was a family priority for Thomas's family for him to be independent. And so we're showing how we're, we're using those pyramid model strategies and how we're focusing on his family's priority, which is that he becomes more independent within his routine. So we show how great he does with his morning routine and he does, um, you know, all of these things pretty independently. You might hear, can you hear, are you laughing because my room directly connects to our youngest classroom and some of them are not napping right now. So my apologies if you hear, hear them, it's kind of fun. Um, and then on the right, you'll see that um, another priority for this particular child's family was um, that we collaborate and partner around some just like mealtime challenging behaviors that we were all seeing. And this shows how his team has is using a strategy that they kind of discussed with the, um, the family first and the family said, okay, go ahead and try it and we'll see if it works and then we can continue to communicate um, about it. But you'll see that his teacher provides like the written demonstration and then also a video of it. And then she also offers to provide the materials that they're using for the family to use at home so they can continue to collaborate around what's working, what's not working, what he seems to like and what he doesn't. Um, or along the lines of this priority that the family has um, for their child. This next example, it feels it feels like we're giving each uh, like subtle cues, like I'm ready to move on. Um, is an example of how we share lengthier information with families, but keep them in the know about what's going on, and then. Um, you know, offer them the opportunity to provide feedback or ask questions. It's also a great way to show that all of the, communi the communication with families can happen on an individual basis, on a whole class basis, on a, a smaller group basis. You know, we can really maximize the, the resources that we have by providing all of these social hits, if you will, um, in those varied kind of grouping sizes uh, as well. So. I just like this example because families know that we're prioritizing um, social, emotional, and behavioral development this year with the pyramid model, and they've already know what our peer-related social skills and friendship skills are that we're teaching them. And the teachers explaining in this email, you might notice that there are less tabletop activities, and that's because we're really trying to emphasize and more systematically offer opportunities for children to play um, with each other and to use these peer related social skills with one another. So it's a little like um, a subtle way to offer a fam families another strategy that they might use at home to support their children to learn these skills. Um, she keeps the conversation going because she says, give me feedback, let me know if you have any questions, and then families will get pictures of all of these things throughout the week that will emphasize and circle back to what she let them know um, that they'll be doing uh, throughout the week. And then this is uh, um, my last example of, um, we, we share um, on our app, we can tag multiple children, which is really nice. And so this is an example of supporting families and sharing information with families around two children, two different goals, but pretty efficiently and also effectively. Because what we've learned is that the more meaningful information that we share with families, um, we, we, all, we always share these pictures with, uh, you know, a, a little bit of a description, something that we're super proud of, or maybe a quote that the child said, and then link it back to the pyramid model that we're emphasizing. and um, we've noticed that the more that we share meaningful information with families, the more that they will share back 
with us. The more that they'll log on, the more that they're referenced, the more that they'll say, hey, I saw that picture, tell me more about that, or I've been seeing that at home too. Like, oh, this makes sense. She's been teaching her older sister how to tap and get her, like, get her attention and share and things like that. Um, we oftentimes use the strategy to end communication with a question or a, what do you like and, and a more specific question or let me know what you think about this or I've been wondering about this to encourage that bi-directional communication and really remind families and emphasize we want to um, to partner with you along all of these things um, but with this example um this little girl with her cast it was a while ago she's she's doing well and she doesn't have the cast anymore um you know she used stay play talk to support this other um to play with this other little girl who's in the next picture um you know whose family had goals around play and then the little girl on the left her family had goals around just being a great friend and um using her peer related social skills. And so we were able to provide these pictures and show how they're both forming friendships. They're both actively engaged for, they played on this day for like 30 minutes with one another. And we were able to say that and just show how successful their children um, are being in school without a lot of effort and just how meaningful that communication is and um, connection is. Uh, with families. And then next, Alana is going to talk about meaningful conversations and difficult conversations because that type of communication that we use, um, we always personally, we, we do that, you know, on the phone or in person to make sure that we have a, a very great opportunity and thorough opportunity to explain ourselves and ensure that people know, you know, what we mean. I forgot I muted myself. Um, I have lots of allergies, so I've been sniffling and didn't want you guys to hear that. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about meaningful conversations. And as um, both the other presenters said, it's really important that we have strong, authentic partnerships with families because that makes us have a strong foundation for having meaningful, meaningful conversations. So I'll give you one example from my personal life. I have a young child with a disability and he has um, some challenging behavior and when he was in this other center um, we didn't have a strong communication our communication wasn't bi-directional and he was doing great from my perspective because i wasn't hearing anything and then all of a sudden i got the, um, the director who came out to me one day and said um, your child's hitting other kids and throwing things a lot in our classroom and it's just really creating a problem so as a parent, I'm like, uh, well, this is the first time I've heard of this. You've never told me about this before. And they're like, it's been an ongoing problem. So it was hard for me as a parent to digest that because I was like, we don't see this at home. This isn't um, something that necessarily makes sense. Um, and because I, we didn't have a strong relationship with them, it was harder for us to digest. And it was harder for me as a practitioner that works in this field to give them feedback because we didn't have mutual trust, right? So we need, we need to have mutual trust and authentic partnerships because if we don't have those things, the conversations are much harder. Families will feel more, um, uh, I guess, less, less like they want to be uh, share information and um, just feel like, I did. Where is this coming from? Um, it also is really helpful when we have com difficult conversations or meaningful conversations with families that we focus on one thing at a time. And um, if you think about when you get feedback from other people, from your supervisor, from a partner, from anyone in your life, it's much easier to take if they give you one piece of feedback at a time. If you get too much feedback, you don't know where to start. You don't know what's the most important thing. And so having, getting, focusing on one thing at a time is really important. And um, like we, what, like Megan uh, explained early, earlier, is we have to fill families' piggy banks all of the time because it's much easier to um, withdraw from a piggy bank if there's something in it uh, to continue the relationship and the partnership than drawing from an empty bank, okay? Because when you draw from an empty bank, you're going in the, in the negative direction. Okay, 
So we've talked about a lot of these strategies already, but it's really helpful to have bi-directional communication. Okay, again, my little child that has some disabilities, he is in a new center now. So um, he has recently started that. And what's great about the bi-directional communication is both me as a family um, benefits and the professionals benefit. So I showed up the first day and they said, what signs does he use? What signs does he understand? Well, the other, thinking back to the other center, we never talked about what signs he understands or uses. So we're already starting on a better, um, a better spot because these professionals are trying to understand my child and, and how he communicates. And then every day they've met me, they've sent me texts or sent me um, pings through our, their app and asked me lots of questions about how do you do this at home so that we can do it in the same way at school so it helps him be set up for success. Um, they said he, he has a cochlear implant and today he was taking his receiver off a lot. So they pinged me and said, what do you do when he takes his receiver off? Um, it, are there things that are helpful to get it back on him because he doesn't seem to want to wear it right now? And I can just pop in and say, this is how we do it. We try a two-step method, then we give him a break, and then we try again. And so they were like, oh, thank you so much because we fought with him for 30 minutes. But once we checked in with you, we knew leave him alone. We gave him, gave him a five-minute break and bam, he was right back in the ward again. So it's just having these short and meaningful conversations back and forth allow my child to be more successful in the classroom because um, teachers are asking for information as they need it. Um, and making sure that families feel safe, um, have an easy way to share information with you because it's hard as a family of having a kid with challenging behavior, having a kid, having things going on at, um, in your lifetime, changes in your structure of your home. And if you don't feel comfortable and have established trust, it's hard to share those things with a stranger. It's hard to share those th um, those uh, your concerns in, um, without having an authentic par partnership. Um, it's helpful to talk about the child's skills. Um, like my example, understand um, helping the center on know what signs he knows or what signs he doesn't know and as he grows to understand communication more how is his skill how are his skills progressing at home um, and how are they progressing at school so that we can if we see new things at either at either place we can communicate and know we need to add these these other skills um, and, and work on them more um, and then they need to feel safe to be able to say hey grandma used to live with us but now grandma no longer lives with us and grandma was the person that took care of our child after school. So this is a big change in our child's life. Um, and this may change how they're gonna interact at school. Okay, and again, um, like Jackie talked about, making sure you share information in preferred ways. So some of the strategies that we talk about in our chapter about um, having difficult conversations with families is that teamwork is a key. That making sure that um, families understand that you're here to support them and um, help them and that again when you express concerns that you express them related to family's goals so if a child is not eating lunch and the family has and the family is not that's not a family's goal for the child to eat lunch at school um, it's not a, it, it's helpful for the families to know the child's not eating lunch but continuing to talk to them about how their child's not eating lunch at school and the family's like well it's fine for us because he eats a big meal before and he eats a big meal after school so we don't really care if he eats at lunch continuing to talk about that with the family isn't isn't that helpful it's more helpful to talk about things that they're bought into and that they care about um, to work on related to their goals and Jackie shared some really good examples of communications around um, kids' goals earlier. It's really helpful to seek parents' perspectives to understand um, how they view challenging behaviors, how they view social skills, which ones are the most important to them. And um, sometimes when young kids have challenging behavior, it's it, uh, families will feel um, not hopeless, but will feel overwhelmed and, and, and frustrated and tired and all of those things. And so it's helpful to say, we're here to work with you today, tomorrow, in the long term, and we know we can help your child be successful. Oh, okay. So the first thing that we talk about, um, how to start difficult conversations, 
uh, is to express your concerns related to the family's goals, like I said, and make sure you talk about the child's strengths. So if it is, speaking of my child again, if he does have cons if he does have problems around sharing is sharing. Well, he is really good about passing out things to his friends, giving things to his friends. He just doesn't want to, um, he doesn't like to share toys, highly preferred toys with friends. So if you talk about some of the good strengths of the child, the child follows directions, all those type of things, it helps the family know, okay, you're not just concerned about the problem, but you see my child as a child who has strengths um, and can be successful. It's helpful to ask the family if the child also has those similar behaviors at home or in the community, because sometimes they do and sometimes they don't, or sometimes they have them with different frequency. And so it's helpful to know if how the family deals with it, if they see it at home, and how um, and and it'll help give you a clue of why these why these behaviors are occurring. Um, it's helpful to use open-ended questions rather than yes or no, because if you say things like, "Is the problem happening at home?" Yes. Okay, there, not much, not much conversation can happen. So using open-ended questions, of, um, like "Tell me how little Johnny follows routines at home," that leaves it more open-ended, so you can get more information from families, and um, they can uh, provide you better information and better, and you can make better connections with them. Okay. And then um, here are some sample statements from our that we also have included in our chapter. It's just really important to. Um, affirm people's uh, beliefs and making sure, like we teach our young children, all feelings are valid. And so we need to make sure we validate parents' feelings, um, we support them, and here are some sample statements that you can use to show supportive statements, but while also talking about and trying to find information out um, from the families. So bottom line, uh, when we have meaningful conversations with families, we need, to with, we need to communicate with families in various ways and continuously um, fill their piggy banks or their buckets because you're going to likely have to withdraw from the bucket at some point in time. So it's much easier to withdraw from a bucket that's full rather than empty. And when you withdraw, using this supportive framework where you seek to understand the family's point of view, what their goals are, and you collaborate with the families to support their child um, and increasing their social skills or decreasing their challenging behavior, then it'll lead to a more successful collaboration and happy families and happy you. Okay, so now we're gonna quickly go through some resources um, that we talked about in the chapter that are related to uh, promoting pyramid, pra pyramid model practices with families at home. Jackie, you might be muted. You're muted. Oh no, I pulled like one of the biggest, <laughs> biggest things that people give you a hard time about, right? Um, so we, uh, additional ways that we can support families. One of the things that I love about the pyramid model and about NCPMI, challengingbehavior.org, where all of these resources are, are that um, you don't have to reinvent the wheel and you can quickly get information across different people and very quickly get on the same page because so much um, of what we're looking for is already developed for us, right? So we can send home materials related to classroom activities, related to, you know, areas that families have said, I really need some support about this. Like Alana was saying, oftentimes families are struggling with things that we're not seeing at school, but um, we're able to provide them resources very efficiently uh, because of what is available for them. Something I will say is I will always download the PDF and provide them the actual PDF just to ensure that I know they're getting like exactly what we're wanting to send them and not getting redirected to, to links and things like that. It's just that extra step of making it just a little bit easier uh, for families I think can be really helpful. Um, Affirming their home language and translating materials into their home language whenever possible, as Megan was saying in the beginning, just 
um, affirming a family's culture and ensuring that we're, that we're partnering with them in a way um, that affirms their home language as well. And sharing excitement about skills that children are learning because something I always said when I um, worked around p severe persistent challenging behavior was like, we have to celebrate this because this is and can be really hard work. And we can be, we should be proud of the children and we should also be proud of ourselves because we partnered together and we we did this and we are awesome too. Um, and then follow up with families. If we send them a resource, you know, give them some time to, to think about it and look it over, but, you know, follow up with them in a few days, ask if they have any questions, send an email and let them know that you're going to be calling them over the next couple of days to just follow up and check in um, and supporting them as a team. So what do some of these resources look like that are available for you and that we talk um, in the chapter about? So support with things like, and these are just some examples too, they're not, you know, all of the social, emotional and behavioral resources that that you might need or that um, that are available for you. But, you know, for emotional regulation, Tucker the Turtle, if you use that in your classroom, now has an at-home version as well. So lots of our families are using Tucker the Turtle at home. And so the child just has this consistent language across all of um, all of the adults who are supporting them with emotional regulation. Um, other resources are, um, related to emotional regulation and calming down, you know, help us stay calm is something that we developed around um, support for the adult, like us, meaning help me stay calm so I can help you stay calm. Um, that's a great resource for families, the relaxation thermometer, taking a break and how to create a calm down area in your home, um, other ways to, you know, regulate and calm down, visuals, taking a deep breath, um, Sorry, the next one. Uh, we have resources for problem solving skills, uh, real pictures for the solution kit now, which is awesome. Backpack connection of oh, problem solving skills. So I know we're just, <laughs> just keeping you on your toes. Yes, it's so exciting. Um, I can speak to it, it's fine. But there's um, solution kits for home and um, school or child care now as well. The Backpack Connections are a great series because they really go more deeply into um, particular you know, areas of information that families might want to know more about, how to use preventative and proactive teaching skills, um, and how to just understand why certain things are happening, also how to respond to um, different challenging behaviors in the home. So I'm oftentimes pulling these um, as families are, are communicating with us about various things that they're seeing or struggling with at home. We also, or the NCPMI also has um, resources on racial equity and talking to children about race and um, some really great pandemic specific um, resources like there's one on helping children to wear masks um, which I think is we've we've pulled on both of those a lot um, you know this year as well as they've become available too so all of these that I just talked about or can be found on challengingbehavior.org. I'm laughing because I don't think we talked about who was um, doing these last slides or maybe we did and I just forgot the fun of a coffee chat. So yeah, you can find all of these on challengingbehavior.org right there in the resource library in that little green box at the top. Um, you can keyword search and get all of these great resources. I think Daniel's going to share the last couple of slides and ask if and leave time for questions as well, which we did five to six minutes. There we go. Great. Well, Jackie, Megan, and Alana, thank you so much for a fantastic presentation. Um, we did get a handful of questions, so I'll try and cover a few in the time that we have. Um, so let's see. Um, so. We had a few listeners who were asking, do you have any recommendations for child care administrators or directors um, for where to really start learning about the pyramid model and then move towards implementation? So 
somebody that's not familiar with the pyramid model where they could start and learn and move towards the implementation? I can take that one. Um, I One, I think um, that I know we're on a, a call series about the book, but I would say this book that was put together is the most comprehensive set of pyramid model information that's written to be used by practitioners. So it is something that you can use ongoing to help yourself as an administrator and support your teachers. And there is a lot of available content on the challengingbehavior.org website. I would say um, dive into the webinar series that look at um, within the pyramid model framework. We have additional webinars that look at kind of those foundational pyramid model practices and what it means to implement the pyramid model um, and really start there and then seek out what at many states we have on our on the website. I don't want to be complicated, but there is a place where you can find states and you can see who the lead pyramid model contact is for your particular state. Many states have state leadership teams that are in charge of this, like how do we help build up programs capacity to implement the pyramid model. So that's one place that we refer people too who are interested more is seek out their state leadership around pyramid model implementation. Jack and Alana, you might have other ideas of how to kind of build up knowledge. No, I think you did great. Um, there's an overview of the pyramid model on the challengingbehavior.org um, website that I would refer you to first. Just it's a 20 minute overview of the it's entire great video. Mm -hmm. I, I would just echo what you said, Megan, the book. Um, I'm like laughing because I'm always like, I promise I'm not trying to like, um, but awesome. all of our, <laughs> all of our classrooms have gotten one and they're constantly, so like each chapter has a checklist and they're very operationalized checklists. And then they're supported by content and tons of examples. Um, all of our classrooms are, are really, um, like heavily, you know, wearing down their, their books right now, just because like you said, it's just super, practitioner friendly and comprehensive mm -hmm. yeah yeah it really is a yeah, great I, book. <laughs> I, I can confirm too the the resource library on the challengingbehavior.org is it has tons and tons and tons of resources so there's there's a lot of information out there for those of you that are unfamiliar with the pyramid model and looking to familiar familiarize yourself with it um let's see uh jackie we were getting a ton of questions about what application you use to communicate with families am i allowed Absolutely. to say that oh. is that like i'm not no i'm joking we use bright wheel um there are lots of great apps um the one thing we're begging them to do is provide more so right now our family our bi-directional communication happens where like we place it in a feed ask a question then families message us through the messenger like we if there's an app out there that allows you to kind of bi-directionally communicate in the feed that would be really cool i don't know if that's a possibility yet um yeah but we we just uh we interviewed a few and that was the best one for us um yeah so. there's tons there's tons out there and there's actually reviews of apps um that child care providers um use and which ones are the best ones but uh one of my ch children, childcare uses Basecamp, and it, it's complicated, but it allows you to do anything you want. Uh, let's see. Um, do you have any? So we had a few listeners who are asking about um, either English learner, English English language learners, or non-English speaking families. Um, so do you have any suggestions or tips for creating an effective partnership um, with these families who? may not speak English or maybe learning English um, as you're working with them. Yeah, the good thing is, is a lot of the resources we presented are available in some languages uh, or multiple languages. Um, they're not available in all languages. And we really recognize that people across the country speak many different languages. But I would say that um, if you have access to an interpreter or a translator, then it's really helpful to have someone um, that can communicate. And sometimes if you don't have access to um, people, then you might have access to a family member um, who is not in their immediate family or someone in a community that they may feel comfortable with. A lot of times we find um, an interpreter in a faith-based community that the family feels comfortable with that will come with a family to um, start the communication. 
with, with us and so that we can have some bi-directional communication and they help us brainstorm what are ways that we can have good communication with families that speak other languages. Um, all right, let's see. Um, uh, going back to the family piggy bank, um, do you have any tips for making deposits for a family that doesn't necessarily make an effort to share their preferences or culture or practices? Um, so I guess kind of tips for engaging a family to open them up and get them to be a little bit more responsive for your program. I think in order, I think there's the element of trust. So I think Alana talked about that, that families have to have that trusting relationship. And so if families are maybe not willing to share information or if they're not comfortable maybe providing that information, um, one, helping families understand what that information is going to be used for um, and allowing families to see examples of maybe how feedback has been used in the classroom. So if you ask, you know, for a particular preference or what do you value, um, sharing that with information. But I think going back to um, in order that level of, if you look at Alana, what she was talking about of those conversations with families that there has to be that authentic relationship so i think that's the place to start um, is building that relationship and maybe on first knowing what is the family able to communicate maybe it's not anything deep but they might be able to tell you you know what did when did the child wake up in the morning and if they're able to communicate that type of information and could you could you go deeper um, so maybe it starts at that more Kind of surface level we think about culture and we there's those surface level things we can understand about a family and then there's that deep kind of authentic culture that takes a while to get to know families um, but the more they see themselves in the classroom and how their community is represented um, what we know is through all that like in a bias work that families um, it does help build that trust and build their communication with you. I don't know if Jackie or Alana, if you have any other. Yeah, I would also just say um, sharing information with them, even if they're not sharing with you, it's helpful to send picture, cute pictures of their kid home and explicitly say, what is the kid doing well? Because then you might see that the families perk up and say, oh, I really like that my child did this. And that gives you an opening to say, oh, tell us how he or she does this at home. Or what are you most proud of that your child does at home? What makes you um, what makes you the happiest? When What does your child do that makes you the happiest? So asking some kind of, most families will tell you um, good things about their kid. And so asking kind of some easier questions or what do you like to do with your child on the weekend or asking anything like that um, can, be, can also be an entry into. Mm -hmm. Talk to great questions. I think, yeah, those are both great. And I would just add, like, things that we've been talking about, making that information that we share with them meaningful and worth it for them, um, you know, and just reflecting in our communication. And as we're especially working on building that relationship initially, um, we really care about your child and we care about your family and just um, tailoring our communication in a way that lets them know those things, um, that encourages them to just build that trust with us as well. Um, okay, so I think that is gonna be all the time that we'll have for uh, questions. Um, so thank you for everyone that submitted questions, and I apologize, we can't get to every question. So um, even if we tried, I think it would be impossible. Um, so just a few things to close out the webinar. Um, so certificates of attendance are available for download in the handout section of your webinar panel. Um, you can also download them from the URL below at bpub.fyi forward slash upm dash partnerships dash cert. Um, and I'll also be sending out a follow-up email tomorrow that'll have a link to get a certificate, a link to the recording of today's webinar, and I'll also include links to all of the resources and websites that Jackie, Megan, and Alana had referenced today during the presentation. So you'll also have access to the slides, but I'll send those out to all of our attendees today. Um, and then you'll also be getting a quick prompt for a webinar webinar survey at the end of this webinar. So if you complete the webinar survey, uh, just let us know what you thought about this webinar. You'll also be entered to win a free copy of Unpacking the Pyramid Bottle. 
and um, we're also extending a discount for all of our attendees and recording viewers today. Um, you can save 20% on Brooks products using the code COFFEE121. So if you're interested in purchasing Unpacking the Pyramid Model, you can save 20% off of that book when you order. And that's at brookspublishing.com. Just make sure to use the code COFFEE121. And we have, um, this is the third webinar in our spring coffee chat series, but we have several more scheduled and we also have tons of recorded webinars. So if you go to bpub.fyi forward slash coffee chats, uh, you'll see all of our upcoming webinars and all of our recorded ones. So those are all there for you to watch as well. And last but not least, um, we have also compiled COVID-19 resources. I think we're all hoping that these may not be necessary in the near future, but um, just you know, as we're continuing along in the in this pandemic, um, so we've compiled a bunch of recommended readings, downloadable resources, and other professional development webinars um, that are helpful for early childhood providers, professionals, and those can be found at bpub.fyi forward slash COVID EC. Um, and again, you'll receive uh, the slides in a uh, link to the slides in the email tomorrow. So if you didn't grab any of these URLs, you can just pull them from the slides. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank everyone that joined us today for our webinar and a huge, huge thank you to Jackie, Megan, and Alana for presenting this uh, terrific webinar. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you again, everybody, and uh, have a great rest of your day.